Good evening, everyone. I'm going to invite those here in the room with us to take your seats. I'm Rabbi Julia Andelman, Director of Community Engagement at JTS, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our annual Bernard G. Siegel Memorial Lecture in Law and Ethics. We were, just, um, we were just a couple of weeks out from the Siegel Lecture in March 2020, and it was one of the first casualties of uh, you know, all the programs that got canceled, so we're really just especially thrilled um, to be back here at the Siegel Lecture as part of our opening season of our 21st century campus here at JTS. So I want to welcome everyone here in the room with us and everyone joining us on the live stream tonight and special welcome to anyone joining us for the first time, whether in person or online. Um, those who are in the room, I want to uh, just ask you to take a moment to silence your cell phone. But you're actually going to need your cell phone during the program. I'll tell you about that. Um, the annual Siegel Lecture was established by JTS in honor of the late Bernard G. Siegel a philanthropist and community leader, the first Jewish president of the American Bar Association, and the first Jewish chancellor of the Philadelphia Bar Association. He was a skilled corporate lawyer who argued nearly 50 cases before the US Supreme Court. In addition to, to his longtime career with the law firm, I hope I say this right, Schneider, did I say it right? Schneider, Harrison, Siegel, and Lewis. He carried out special assignments for four presidents, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. And he was devoted to extending the influence of the organized bar in matters of legal policy nationwide. He was also recognized for his, quote, indefatigable efforts to expand and improve legal services for the poor, the powerless, and the dispossessed. He served as a leader for his alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania the Jewish Publication Society, the Philadelphia Allied Jewish Appeal, and the Hebrew University, where the Law Library is named for him. And JTS awarded him an honorary Doctor of Laws degree in 1977. Um, and this tribute closes with a quote from Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who said, Bernie represents the highest and best ideals of the legal profession. We are so pleased to be joined tonight by two of Bernie Siegel's grandchildren, Mark Cohen and Jennifer Cohen. It's so great to see you again. And by his former law partner, Bruce Rosenfield. And um, it's great to see you again as well. And we're so grateful to you for everything you do to make this program happen. So our topic this evening, as you know, is hate on trial. And we are truly honored to be joined by three distinguished experts on the landmark Charlottesville trial and the very weighty issues raised by the case. Roberta Kaplan, Dr. Risa Galubuff, and Alan Levine. So our speakers will be sharing with us both their legal expertise and their personal perspectives on the issues at stake for our democracy and for the American Jewish community. So I get to introduce our distinguished moderator, who will in turn introduce his colleagues. Alan Levine is senior counsel and former head of the international law firm of Cooley LLP and a leading trial lawyer in the United States. He was a key member of the legal team in the Charlottesville case. He's a partner in the commercial litigation and white collar and regulatory defense practice groups of Cooley LLP's litigation department. During his nearly 45-year legal career, he's represented numerous individuals and companies in complex civil, criminal, and regulatory matters, and he's appeared in federal and state courts throughout the country, including the U.S. Supreme Court. He's also held key leadership positions in the legal community, including recently being elected board president of the New York City Legal Aid Society. And Alan is also chair of the JTS Board of Trustees. He joined the board in 1998, became vice chair in 2009, and chair in 2015. And he has a long and distinguished career of leadership in the Jewish community in addition to his service to JTS. So our plan for tonight is, and so, yeah, so thank you, Alan, for doing this other role than what you normally do. It's a, it's a treat to, to see you uh, in, this, in this context. Um, our, here's our plan, here's the plan for the program. So Alan is going to lead an extended conversation with our two panelists, and then we'll have 
time for audience Q&A. So we are experimenting with a system that will allow us to engage both um, those of you here in person and those of you on the live stream in an egalitarian way in Q&A. Um, and we're using a very simple online tool called Mentimeter. So you can let us know afterwards what you think of this experiment. Um, so the live stream viewers, you should be able to see the URL and the password right on your screen just below the video window where you're watching me and those in the room should have received the information on a piece of paper. Um, and I'll announce it, you, I'll announce it again later. Um, but you can feel free to submit questions at any point during the program. When we get to the q and I'll select from um, the questions that have been submitted and we'll pose as many questions to our panelists as we have time for. And our plan is to end by 9 p.m. Eastern time. So on that note, Alan, I turn things over to you to introduce your fellow speakers and begin the program. Thank you, Rabbi Edelman. Uh, it's great to be here. It's my third night out of four that I'm on, I'm on this, uh, on the Bima. Um, so uh, let's get right to it because we have two very distinguished guests. Um, uh, Roberta Kaplan, Robbie Kaplan, uh, is no stranger to JTS. Uh, she's a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Harvard, a graduate of Columbia Law School. She clerked for the Honorable Judith Kay and the Chief Judge of the New York Court of Appeals. She joined the law firm of Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison after the clerkship, making partner in record time and staying there until 2017, when she left to form her own firm, now a very well-known litigation boutique, not such a boutique anymore, Kaplan, Hecker, and Fink. She's an extraordinary lawyer, litigator, and I can speak of that skill firsthand as we met in the 1990s, working on a matter on the same side. Of course, her Work as a litigator is now legendary, and I mean legendary, as she represented Edith Windsor, challenging certain provisions of the Defense of Marriage Act, and won a landmark ruling from the United States Supreme Court that a key provision of the statute violated the U.S. Constitution by barring legally married same-sex couples from enjoying the benefits of marriage. She's been honored by every legal entity and organization for her work, all justly, uh, for the work for Edith Windsor and for all of her other litigation. Um, but the honor I like most uh, is the honor from us. She accepted an honorary doctorate uh, here at JTS in 2015. Um, it's Robbie who conceived of the lawsuit that we'll discuss tonight and was its principal champion. I was privileged to try the case with her side by side with others in the courtroom. She recruited me to the Charlottesville litigation uh, at a Shabbat service <laughs> in August 2017 in Rabbi Jan Erbach's congregation She'd actually recruited me to that congregation several years before. Uh, Robbie is a card-carrying uh, member of the conservative movement, and it's a great privilege to have her here tonight with us. Um, Dean Galyabov, a graduate of Harvard College, summa cum laude, Yale Law School, where she was senior editor of the Law Journal, she appears to have overlapped law school with a PhD program in history at Princeton. She clerked for a renowned Second Circuit judge, Guido Calabresi, and then went on to clerk for the soon to be retiring Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer. She's been on the faculty of UVA Law School since completing her clerkship. However, she has taken semesters to teach at the uh, University of the Tel Aviv Law School, at the London School of Economics, University of Chicago, and NYU. She's the author of two books, the most recent, a compelling study of the vagrancy laws in the United States, which I commend to all of you, and to too many 
Lott's Law Review articles to mention. She became dean of the UVA Law School in 2016 and serves in that position to this day. Just a few days ago, she could be seen testifying in the United States Senate Judiciary Committee hearings on the nomination of Judge Jackson to the Supreme Court. I first met uh, Risa uh, in 2017 in one of my early trips to Charlottesville in connection with the case. We share a mutual friend. Uh, putting the personal relationship aside, which is a lovely one, we invited her to speak here today about the Charlottesville case because she has multiple perspectives on it. And I don't think those different perspectives have been shared in any of the conversations that at least I've participated in about the trial. Uh, of course, she is a constitutional scholar specializing in civil rights. She's a historian of the civil rights period, but she also was dean of the law school at the time of the Unite the Right rally uh, and a member of the synagogue in Charlottesville, CBI, and a mother of two children who were young teenagers at the time of these events. So Dean Galyubov has, wears many hats for this discussion and brings her scholarship as well. So with all of that long introduction, uh, Robbie, um, could you set the stage um, for everybody? What was UTR? What was Unite the Right and the case that you envisioned and brought? Before I do that, is this working? Yeah. Before I do that, I have to tell everyone why it is I asked you to join the case. So we were sitting in that August Shabbat morning, supposedly praying um, in Jan Shaw. And Al and I were sitting together as we often were when we were both there. And I thought to myself, who would be better at deposing and cross-examining Nazis than Alan Levine? <laughs> so I had to tell you, I can't tell where, I can't remember where the servers it was. It probably wasn't a good thing for me to do, but I basically nudged him and I was like, hey, you wanna go depose a bunch of Nazis? And that's how it all began. So, um, so tell us about the Unite the Right rally. And you had this vision for a case using a statute that really was uncommon, actually. Yeah, so it's basically a story of the way everything is in life of just happenstance. And what happened is that um, I opened my, my law firm on July 1st, 2017. But for the first month, we didn't have any space. We were working out of, I mean, today, then it seemed weird today. I guess it's not weird. We were working out of our homes, and we kind of borrowed a friend's barn somewhere, and we were working there. Um, our lease began as I recall, on August 7, 2017. So the first week we were all in the office and kind of work, all of us, there were six of us, I think, at the time. And working together was the week before, was the week before Charlottesville. Um, when Charlottesville happened, it was, I think, our first full week that next Monday in the office. And kind of naively, kind of like a schnook, I thought to myself, okay, I want this law firm to be dedicated to public service. So we'll order in pizza and we'll watch at lunch kind of the news coverage of what, it, what had happened. Why do I say kind of like a schnook? It really wasn't pizza watching material. Um, and I remember sitting there and watching the coverage and I think that was the day that Donald Trump said there are good people on both sides. And I thought to myself, something needs to be done about this. And I was very, very worried, rightly so, that the then Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who doesn't exactly have a great record on civil rights, probably wasn't gonna do anything. Um, and so I thought, okay, I guess I will. Um, and I called, so we kind of watched that. And I think the next thing I did is I called a, a dear friend of mine who you probably know for her, from her writing, Dolly Lithwick, who writes about the Supreme Court um, for Slate Magazine. She's also a friend of Risa's and Allen's. Uh, I called her not for her legal advice, I called her because she was then living in Charlottesville. <laughs> and I said, I've got this crazy idea I'm thinking about bringing a case about Charlottesville because I'm worried that that's the only way, you know, no one else is gonna do this. What do you think? And she said, well, she said, not crazy. Why don't you come down? I'll introduce you to some people um, and we'll go from there. And so I think within about 72 hours of that call, we were in Charlottesville. There were three of us, I remember distinctly. Uh, the town, and you may, I'm sure you recall this, Risa, was really still in a state of shock. 
Uh, there were white, ironically, Mercedes vans that the neo-Nazis and KKK members had used to kind of drive into Charlottesville and around Charlottesville. And they were reportedly still driving around town, at least in the African-American neighborhood. So people were super spooked by that. Uh, we met with a whole bunch of people, um, including a couple of at least who became our plans. Reverend Seth was boy for sure, was someone we met on that first trip. Um, and we told people, I mean, this is what's truly amazing about it. We said, look, we know, you know, you were hurt by this. Some of these, some of the people we met with were hit by the car. Uh, we know, uh, you know, we're, you, were you were damaged and you may want, it, may want to and need to get money really quickly. Um, we were honest. We said, this lawsuit is not the way to do it. <laughs> there are other potential claims you could have, but this lawsuit is going to take a lot of time. And even when we win, we don't know how much money will be at the end of the tunnel. And every single one of our nine plaintiffs really bravely, I mean, really meant she signed up to be in this case. Um, so there, we had the plaintiffs, and they ranged from people who were there on the night of August 11th when they encircled a group of students, undergrads mostly, around the Thomas Jefferson statute at the Rotunda, and two of our plaintiffs testified that they literally thought they were going to die uh, that night, uh, to people who were hit by the car the next, the next afternoon on Saturday. So we had plaintiffs. Um, the next lucky break we got is someone, and I to this day do not know who, managed to hack into the servers, the, which were on a, a server called Discord, which previously had been really a gaming server, like gamers used it who, to talk about their video gaming. I, I don't know exactly what they did, but it was very popular among video gamers, and it had been kind of taken over uh, by the, what was then called the alt-right. Uh, and they were actively recruiting people who liked video games. I guess there's a certain synchronicity there. Um, and someone hacked into that server and released onto the internet a whole bunch of the messages that the various groups and individuals used for really for months leading up to August 11th to plan in detail what was going to happen in Charlottesville. So most times when you bring a case, you don't have what's called discovery before you file a complaint. Uh, but here we had this treasure trove, and honestly, I don't think we would have been able to file a complaint that survived a motion to dismiss without it. So we had that. We used that to kind of identify from their own messages who the leaders were, how they were coordinating with each other, to tell the story and to identify who we were going to sue. Um, and then, as Alan referred to, the, actually the hard part was finding the law to use. Um, there's not a lot of, of laws out there that pertain to this kind of an incident. Partly, and I'm going to be optimistic about this, because I don't think most people didn't expect that incidents, incidents like this would happen. But there is a law called the Ku Klux Klan Act, which I don't even want to talk about in front of Risa because she's really an expert on it. But the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871 that was passed by the Reconstructionist Congress to implement the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment is about slavery, eradicating slavery. And it basically says that when private citizens conspire together to, to deprive African Americans and their allies of their civil rights through violence, racially motivated violence, you violate the statute. Um, it's not a statute, I'll be honest with you, that's used very often and even less so successfully in American history. Um, it was used a bit after it was passed. It was used in the 20s, recent, I think I have this right, in the 20s a bit when there were race riots. And it was, most success, it was used most recently successfully in the civil rights area. There are a couple of Freedom Rider cases using the KKK Act. Most of the cases get dismissed, they're brought by prisoners and they're found to be meritless. Um, but we decided to use this statute to, to construct this statute to construct this lawsuit. We also sued, as you will hear, under various Virginia statutes. Um, and we basically told this wide-ranging, shockingly detailed, shockingly organized conspiracy of these true hate groups. I mean, I don't, I don't know how else to put it. Violent hate groups who planned for weeks to come to Charlottesville, provoked mostly by, they hate everyone, but mostly by anti-Semitism, honestly. Uh, to commit violence on the streets of Charlottesville, and that's what happened. They succeeded, and then they celebrated it. They were thrilled about what happened, and that's the case we brought. So, uh, Dean Galyubov. Um, Risa, please. Risa. Um, <laughs> give us your perspective from that time, from being 
in Charlottesville, being a member of the synagogue, being a parent of two teenage children you had to explain this to, being a dean of the law school and all of that, and the af immediate aftermath at the university. The university took a, a hit public relations for its, its, uh, its reactions during the day, so. That's a tall order. Okay, I'll, I'll start with the... And then, and then we'll <laughs> take a break for dinner and come back okay. tomorrow morning. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the personal piece. Um, and Robbie mentioned, uh, you know, that a few days later, you know, it really, it, it was over, but it wasn't quite over. And we did not realize that. Um, and my kids were 11 and 13 at the time, and it was really their summer of new independence and they were taking an art class downtown and they would take the bus there and back and um and uh and they were leaving their art class that tuesday after uh the events happened over the weekend and the teacher said where, where are you guys going and they said we're going down to to get the bus and she was like no you are not i mean you know she, we we didn't realize what was still happening and and she said i'm going to take you to the bus and they said there were still a lot of people hanging around the mall and you, we just hadn't realized and my son at the time and for many years has worn his camp cbi t-shirts he has a whole a whole wardrobe of them and he wore them every day and he was wearing one that day and she said i can't i can't let you do this and and she took them to the bus and i i think um we after that had long conversations as a family you know could he continue to wear those t-shirts and under what circumstances and we decided as a family that he could and he should but um but we couldn't believe we were having those conversations and um you know we had been uh, a year before that, we had gone to Munster, Germany, and uh, had really been struck as a Jewish family in a small town like Charlottesville that had taken for granted our safety um, in a way that Jewish communities don't everywhere, and communities of color don't in Charlottesville and elsewhere, but we really had. And when we'd been in Munster, you know, there was a, 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 a police officer outside the synagogue at any time someone was inside. And we went for Shabbat services and talked to people and they talked about having to make choices about wearing a kippah and wearing other indicators of being Jewish out in public. And we had conversations as a family about how foreign that was to us and how badly we felt for them. And then, you know, here we were not very long after experiencing that kind of vulnerability that we had not experienced before. And the synagogue built a new wall in front of it. And there is now a security guard out front whenever anyone's inside and the building is locked. Are things that people in New York have lived with for a long time and people elsewhere. But in Charlottesville, you know, you, people don't lock their doors. People, that's, there isn't a heightened sense of security. And, and that vulnerability was, um, was really significant significant uh, uh, afterward. Um, and, my, you know, my daughter's going to college next year, and her college essay was right about this building that had sheltered her and her different feelings about it after Charlottesville, that she had to now protect this place and this community. Um, so, so I think, uh, so one other kind of data point on that, on the, the vulnerability piece, and then I'll, I'll talk about a different part, but um, our synagogue in sixth grade does a Jewish history uh, is the, the theme of the year. And there was, we had done with my daughter before 2017, when she was in sixth grade, um, a unit on the Inquisition. And we would come in in the dark on the side door as Moranos and, and the lights would be out and we would use candlelight. And it was a real uh, exercise in empathy for living under a different kind of regime than we lived under. And my son was in sixth grade right after that. And we did that exercise right after. And it was a completely different thing. Before it had been an exercise in indifference and in not our world. And obviously we were still not living in the Spanish Inquisition, but, but it felt it felt so much more present and, and so much more relevant to our lives in a way that was so disheartening. Um, I can talk about other things, but I'll stop there on the personal side. Well, um, <clears throat> discuss what, uh, what it was like at the law school and the university uh, immediately in the aftermath of, uh, 
of these events. So Elizabeth Sines is the, the name plaintiff in the case that Robbie brought. She's a law student. There were uh, a number of uh, law students and law faculty and administrators who were there that day as legal observers, who drove ambulances, uh, makeshift ambulances, who were really um, involved. Uh, I, I became more involved even than dean of the law school. I was um, asked to chair the university's uh, working group of deans to respond. So I took on a leadership role for the university for that following year. Um, and in that capacity, I spoke with a lot of students and a lot of community members. And, um, you know, one of the things uh, that, that was really palpable in the aftermath was the way that the events meant quite different things to different groups of students. Um, so our, our Jewish students and faculty and staff were very worried about physical safety and very worried that these vans were still around, that people were still here and that they would come back. You know, prior to August 11th and 12th, there had been several Klan rallies uh, earlier that summer and in the spring that had not ended in this kind of violence, but, um, but it, it didn't necessarily seem like this was over. Um, and, uh, and there was additional security uh, put in place and additional kind of ambassadors put around campus and, uh, and around the town. Um, and, and so it was a, it was a sense of, of, of physical vulnerability. Um, the black students and our students of color really responded, they, they were, number one, the police didn't necessarily seem safe to them. So there was some amount of tension there, right? How do you make people feel physically safe, but yet when the police feel like a threat, that's a, a challenge. Um, but but it also, the events really heightened the lack of a sense of belonging of our black students, faculty, and staff. And so a lot of the university's response was much more focused on race than on anti-Semitism. Um, and over the course of the year, I spoke with Jewish groups in Charlottesville and was always asked the question, right, why is the university talking so much about race and not talking as much about anti-Semitism? And I I think the real answer was for our Jewish students, they felt, a, 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 that's not to say uniformly or always, but they felt a sense of belonging at the university. And this didn't threaten that. It threatened their sense of physical safety. Um, but our black students don't feel as great a sense of belonging and our history, you know, is there's a good reason for that. Um, and that it was really clear that there was so much work to be done by the university that continues now that it had been doing before, but, but you know, made, made, was a moment to really think about that. And so the nature of what our different communities needed and then how the university responded to them, I think was quite different. So um, the KKK Act and the Virginia hate crime statute uh, apply to racially motivated violence against minorities. And of course, uh, in our case, the violence was directed at Jews and blacks and their supporters. Um, I remember a conversation with the rabbi at CBI before the trial when he tried to give me, us, a heads up about the jury selection and that the community, the larger community, he said, wouldn't be that familiar with anti-Semitism, would of course understand um, racial animus for blacks, but he said, you really have to take a very different approach. Of course, we had discussed that ahead of time. Robbie, you were particularly interested in that. I think it would be interesting for the audience to hear how, what was the trial strategy that we used to deal with these very different starting points of understanding and attitudes about uh, the racial animus with blacks and the anti-Semitism? So let me begin with jury selection, then I'll go on to the, the, the merits part of the trial. So jury selection in this case was quite extraordinary. Um, I think we went, Alan, remind me, through five panels, I think yes. it took? It Over took 100 people. It took three days? Yes. Um, uh, because of where Charlottesville sits, the, the veneer pool, which is called as a legal term, but where possible jurors live is in all the surrounding counties going out for quite some miles. So it's a very interesting combination between people who live in Charlottesville and this, the next county, which is Arbor Mall, which is only about, 
I think, 12% of the pool. And then everyone else comes from other surrounding, mostly rural counties, who obviously have very, very different views. Um, I'm going to tell kind of a crazy story, but I might as well since I'm here. So uh, during jury selection, we really got every kind of random lucky break you could get. Um, we ended up with five out of 12 African-American jurors, which was twice the percent, more than twice the percentage, four times the percentage, I think, that would have existed in the pool overall. Um, and it just, to describe jury selection to you is kind of hard, but there's all these, like there's, they have cards for the jurors that happens, there's random stuff in terms of what kind of a job the, the juror has, are they going to be able to serve, are they is a solo proprietor, and then they're automatically excused, et cetera. And every one of those lucky breaks went for us. If someone was very hostile, we'd find out that he had, the person had a solo business and the judge would excuse them. Um, over and over and over again, and it got to be, I'm not the kind of person who ever wins a roll of the dice, so it kind of got to be a little bit crazy for me. So I think it was on the third night, I know I called you too, I called <laughs> my friend Dahlia um, and Rabbi Erbach. And I said to them, look, you know, I'm not really the kind of person who wins things, but I have to tell you, every lucky break we're getting. And both of them said on the phone to me, uh-huh. And I said, no, 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 but every single lucky break is going our way. And they both said, uh-huh. And I said it a third time. And I remember, I think it was Dahlia who said, Robbie, are you trying to say that you think there is divine intervention in your jury selection? And I said, I, I said, no, that's not what I'm saying. She's like, Robbie, what have you been drinking tonight? <laughs> and then I called uh, Rabbi Erbach afterwards, and he said, Robbie, I don't think God intervenes that way in terms of human life, so I don't think that that's what's going on. But it truly was miraculous, and we ended up with a jury that I don't think ever, you almost ever get in this courthouse of five black African Americans and seven white jurors. Um, so that takes us to the real, the, merit, the merits problem in the case was how to explain to these African-American jurors that, and I don't think I'm exaggerating here, 90% of what the defendants in the case said in terms of expressing hatred was anti-Semitism. That, that doesn't mean that they don't hate black people. Believe me, they hate black people. And it doesn't mean they don't hate immigrants, they hate immigrants and women, and gay people, you name it, they hate them all. I never really understood intersectionality before this case. I do now understand it. Um, but when they talk about it, it's all about the Jews. And, and it's somewhat ironic, I think, or somewhat odd, since most of these people live in rural parts of the country. I don't think they have Jewish neighbors or have much experience with Jews, but they are truly obsessed with the Jews. Um, so the way we did that was of course probably the best possible way, is we decided to put uh, Professor Deborah Lipstadt on the stand as an expert. Um, and she testified about the anti-Semitism she saw in the case, the neo-Nazi imagery and rhetoric that was just infused in everything they did and said. And she explained why it existed. Um, she said it all comes down to a theory that's known as replacement theory. It's kind of the American version of Nazi ideology beginning in the 1970s. Um, and it's an idea that, and it goes all the way back to ancient anti-Semitism, that the Jews are a small group of people who have inordinate amounts of power and, and brains, but in a kind of evil, crafty way. And all the gains by all minorities in our country, including black people and gay people and women, were done by the Jews to help the Jews, and that none of those groups could do it on their own. They needed the Jews to help them, and that's why they hate Jewish people most of all. They literally think, if you look at those, think about those old Nazi propaganda posters, that Jews are the puppet masters, kind of, mastering all the bad things that they say, see in society. So the very first, this is before even the jury got in, one of the very first conferences in Charlottesville, oh, this is it really, we're now getting really weird. There's a, there was a lawyer on the other say, side named Joshua Smith. Uh, he's of Jewish origin, and he got up really early in the case and said to the judge, you know, judge, I'm a Jew, 
and I am sick and tired of Jews who say the Holocaust, the Holocaust, the Holocaust. There's, there's nothing that makes me more disgusted than Jews who just repeat the Holocaust all the time. And so I'm making a motion now, Judge, that they should not be able to refer to the Holocaust. So I'm, I'm not known always for my, my passive nature. So as I'm listening to this speech, I'm saying to myself, keep it calm, Robbie, keep it calm, keep it calm. And when he was finished, I stood up and I said, Judge, we don't need to use the word the Holocaust. We can just use their own words. They said, burn the Jews, oven the Jews, gas the kikes. Those are all referring to the Holocaust, Judge, but we're going to use to what they said. We don't need to characterize it in any way. Um, and it was true that the amount of anti-Semitic rhetoric, it just became a daily occurrence. Like, we talked in this trial about Mein Kampf the way someone here would talk about the New York Times. I mean, it literally came up multiple times a day, every day in court. Um, and Professor Lipstadt, who I very much hope gets confirmed as the ambassador on anti-Semitism, really explained to the jury what it was all about. I, I was watching the jurors, they were all wearing masks, masks, but to the extent you could, I was watching their faces when they were hearing her testify, and I could really see, particularly on, on the African-American jurors and some of the others, that they didn't really know they hadn't previously heard what she was talking about. They didn't, I'm sure they knew the word the Holocaust, but they didn't really knew, know what it entailed. And I could see in their eyes kind of the surprise and the shock of what she was testifying about. And I think they, based on the verdicts, I think they really understood the connection um, in the case between the anti-Semitism and all the other hatred uh, that unfortunately they had to hear for the, all the weeks of trial. Um, so just follow up on that for a second, Robbie. Um, <clears throat> we were all subjected to um, uh, anti-Semitism during the trial, and particularly both of us <laughs> on the internet about uh, the New York Jew lawyer. Uh, I was rated A plus, the most obnoxious. Um, <laughs> but uh, I which, was right, in sure. which, which I'm, it's one of the I don't know, best awards I think I've ever gotten. <laughs> Um, but you, you have uh, been attacked by them daily now for four years, continuing to this day. I mean, we, we get a readout every day of what the white supremacists are saying and doing. They're still, they still are, are targeting you. What's that, what's that been like for you? I mean, at first I have to admit it was it's pretty shocking. And one of the defendants in the case, uh, Chris Cantwell, who was pro se, we, can, we should talk about this, was pro se meaning he didn't have a lawyer in the case. He was also a federal prisoner, um, but he was allowed to represent himself. The marshals would kind of bring him in and out of the courtroom at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. And the judge, I think mostly, almost all, because of his pro se status and because the judge didn't want there to be an issue on appeal, really let him do almost anything he wanted, and most of which was pretty insane. Um, but Cantwell was in jail at the time for issuing uh, violent threats, believe it or not, against a, another white supremacist. <clears throat> um, a week before he made the threat that he was convicted on, he made a threat about me saying something like, we're going to have a lot of effing fun with her when this trial is over. So it was hard, not just getting these threats online, but being in a courtroom every day with this guy who was really acting on his own behalf. I mean, I think I did what, dealt with it the way I deal with things like this, is which I just kind of created a line in my brain and I tried to ignore it. Um, but at the closing in particular, um, he really, he threatened not only the jurors, he got very threatened to the jurors and very threatening to me. Um, but there were a lot of marshals in the room, including a couple marshals from New York City. Uh, and they made it very clear to me they, they had my back the whole time. Yeah. Um, uh, just to add, I mean, you, 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 you had security with yes. you, right? Yeah. I mean, you should describe that. People yeah, don't no, realize, we, we right? were, Yeah, we were in a, in a hotel, um, uh, and we were restricted to three floors. There were guards on each of the floors. We had a common area of one of the floors. We were taken to and from the courthouse every day. Uh, if any of us wanted to go do anything else, um, we had to have one of the security people. Um, I, I'm Spilkes, I need to get out in the evening. 
Um, there's a great whiskey bar uh, in, on uh, downtown, and these two security guys would go with me <laughs> down to the whiskey bar. Uh, but we felt very secure at, at the end of the day. Uh, um, the, um, there was clergy outside the courthouse every afternoon when we left. That was the extent of the public demonstration of all kinds of people. Um, but go going back, going back. Can I add one thing? Sure, so sure. One, one of the remarkable things both um, on August 11th and 12th and then afterward was really the unity of the clergy in Charlottesville and the support, the ecumenical support across every uh, religion and religious denomination in Charlottesville um, was, was really a remarkable thing and continues, those relationships, you know, continue to this yeah, day. Yeah, that's, uh, we had really warm welcome at the synagogue throughout, uh, throughout the four years. I mean, I remember our first, right at the time that we filed the lawsuit, um, we were finalizing the draft and it was right at Simchat Torah and I went to Simchat Torah services uh, and violated my rule of using my iPhone and took a picture that I sent to all of my rabbis up in New York. It was very emotional uh, to go to that synagogue during those four years and to have the relationship with the rabbi given what they lived with. And I think it might be interesting, I mean, Risa, since you're actually a member of that synagogue, what that synagogue lived through. Um, it just to, there were demonstrations um, in front of that synagogue, uh, chanting Jews will not replace us, you will not replace us into the ovens. We originally had allegations about that conduct in the complaint and the judge made a very negative comment about the nature of those allegations as essentially being protected speech in an early motion. And so we ended up not using that evidence at trial because we had this torch march rally that of course I'm sure all of you have seen referred to of four or 500 men with lit kerosene torches marching through university campus chanting Jews will not replace us into the ovens. Um, so uh, it, it, that was really our anti-Semitic violence and then they attacked these students and there was a lot more, but c come back to what happened in the synagogue because I, I saw that synagogue go through a... a so I was not there that day, um, but it was on Shabbat uh, it was a Saturday morning, and a number of members of the congregation were present. And um, you know, the the there's a glass windows that face onto the street, and it's a public sidewalk. And they were amassed out there, chanting and threatening uh, uh, outside. And I I think you know the synagogue moved the Torahs before uh, before that day, right? Worried about what might happen, um, uh, moved them to a different location. Um, and the the synagogue, just so you have a sense, is is right downtown, um, and it is. Uh, literally next to one of the Confederate <laughs> statues that was, you know, the 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 asserted reason for the Unite the Right was to protest uh, the statues coming down, one of Stonewall Jackson and one of Robert E. Lee, and the synagogue is next door to the Stonewall Jackson one, and just you know a block away from the Robert E. Lee. These are the parks where. The preschool kids go play, and you know th this is this is the neighborhood. So the the violence and the uh, the the rallies were really really close generally, um, but they did you know seemingly target coming to the synagogue, standing out in front of it, and uh, and chanting inside. Um, 
My sister-in-law is here tonight, actually, and um, my family was visiting a year later uh, when, uh, on the anniversary, with their, we went for Shabbat uh, services on the anniversary, and it was it was a hard thing. I mean, it was a year later, and it's it felt dangerous. Uh, the streets had been cleared all around the synagogue, even a year later, and uh, and it you know I I think for the city of Charlottesville generally, I think these events were really traumatic. I think for our black community, they were very traumatic, I think for the Jewish community. And, you know, the city is still figuring its way through um, afterward. And, and I, think, uh, I think that's true for, for, for the synagogue. Um, Robbie, uh, and of course, after Charlottesville, you had, we all had the uh, Tree of Life, uh, uh, Pittsburgh shooting, we had the Poway shooting. Um, I want to ask a, like a provocative question here, uh, both of you. Uh, what should um, uh, American Jews be feeling um, in light of uh, Unite the Right, and how is it different from from events like the Tree of Life and and Poway? So when we filed the case, when you and I filed the case, Alan, in October 2017, I honestly, naively. Uh, thought that it was going to be a one-off, that we, ne we needed to do something about it, we need to bring the case. But I, I honestly had no expectation that the kinds of things that we've seen in this country since, and worldwide really, since Charlottesville ha have been so similar and could be traced to Charlottesville. So uh, the, the shooter at Tree of Life was in communication on these kind of dark web networks with the defendants in our case. The guy who did the violence in New Zealand um, had on, I think, his, his rifle, I think, something called a fash tag, fascist tag, um, that was developed by one of the defendants in our case, Matthew Heimbach. Um, you know, the, this is something that's talked about a lot today. The internet and technology obviously have brought us amazing things to our society and an amazing good. They also, uh, have and still are and can be used, are, they can be a curse. Um, and when the KKK Act was passed in 1871, it was intended to prevent basically men meeting in the woods in Alabama or Mississippi wearing robes and hoods. Um, today, it's much, much easier. You get your anonymity with a hashtag. Um, you can literally organize internationally and they do their connections worldwide between these groups. Um, and this method of organizing on the internet, sadly, also has roots you know, in, ter in terms of what led up to January 6th. It was organized, from what we know even today, in a very similar way to the way the defendants in our case organized Charlottesville. So um, I, I guess I'm kind of glad in October 2017 I didn't know what was going to come. Um, but there's no question that Charlottesville provided the model sadly, hor horrifically, tragically, for so much of what ensued over the next four, five, six years. How do you see these issues, Risa? Um, the effect, uh, what, what should American Jews be, be concerned about in view of this activity of these last couple of years? I don't think I'm the right person to answer that. I would turn that back to you, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I, I, I think the Charlottesville case is, uh, and the events are very different uh, than the Tree of Life um, because uh, I think it's uh, large groups of people organizing mass demonstrations, um, using Nazi memes and themes and posters and flags and guns and everything. Uh, um, so it's different than a one-off shooting. Um, and I think it's scary. Um, so I ask you, Dean. So, so I have, okay, so but I can I want to ask you the First Amendment question. So, so that was a good setup for it, and I was going to volunteer it even after de demurring initially. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think 
uh, it's not only the the number of people on the scale of the planning, but it's also and you know, Robbie, I, was it schnook? Was that the technical word that you described yourself as with the pizza? Um, uh, you know, everybody was a schnook, right? I mean, the the image that they wanted to project and the image that I think they fairly successfully convinced other people to accept of them was the image you have in your head of Skokie, right? The image of, uh, of the Nazis uh, walking peacefully. We can discuss whether you can walk peacefully with such hate. I know that's a question you want to talk about, but walking peacefully, um, you know, down the street with, w- without violence, over violence, and, uh, and that's what they wanted people to believe they were doing. And I think it took a very long time for people to change their frame. I think, you know, as part of my 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 role in leading the university's response, we did a review of the police response on grounds on campus on Friday night. And, you know, the main conclusion I drew was it was just, it took a long time for the police response and for, I think, everyone to realize, oh, this is not a peaceful protest, right? These are not what they purport to be, what we assume free speakers who come to civilly and peacefully protest are doing. And and I think that's part of why people found it so compelling and provocative and why it became such a big issue was because that was not what they said they were there to do. That was not what we expected them to do. And it was very hard to shift the frame and say, oh, and this is what Robbie does in the case, right? Actually, they were here to do violence. They were here to provoke violence. They were planning that from the beginning, but, but that was not how people understood them. And that's not how pe- they wanted to be understood. So one of the very interesting uh, aspects of the case that Robbie referred to before was getting this Discord channel evidence, which was really kind of like a wiretap, if you will, that you heard in real time what they were doing and organizing. And privately, their plan was to provoke the violence. Um, And through the cross-examinations of the white supremacists, one after another, we proved the racial animus of each of them then we prove the intent to provoke the violence. Um, do you think, do you think uh, uh, Dean Galyubov is a constitutional scholar? Um, is the First Amendment too nice? Is it too overprotective here? When, when people are marching, chanting Nazi phrases that themselves are inherently violent, um, are and are provoking violence. That's as our proof showed. Is Robbie open to the jury? They had every intention of provoking the violence. Um, are, are, is our constitution giving too much protection to this kind of activity? <laughs> So let me step back and say our Constitution does protect speech, even of a hateful nature, right? So I think there's a lot of um, uh, misapprehension about the First Amendment and what's protected and what it does. And a lot of people think hate speech is not protected, but it is, right? As you say, hate speech is protected under the First Amendment. Now, historically and today, you know, the one of the big dividing lines for protected versus not protected is the distinction between speech and conduct. And so hate speech is protected, hate crimes are not protected, right? And, um, and I think that the move that you're making is to say the speech is inherently violent. That is not what the doctrine would say, right? The doctrine would say, you know, if there's an imminent threat, that's going to, that can be prevented or prohibited. You know, one of the important pieces of the case that Robbie, that you guys brought is, um, you know, the fact that it's speech doesn't immunize it from uh, liability and speech in the furtherance of a conspiracy 
you know, just because you're speaking to do the conspiracy doesn't mean that that speech is protected, right? So, um, you know, I don't want to paint too broad a brush about what's protected, but, um, but, but it certainly is the case, and I think it is the subject of a lot of discussion right now, um, you know, whether our First Amendment should not protect hate speech. It is different from uh, free speech pr uh, provisions elsewhere in the world that uh, have limitations for dignitary harm of like Nazism, um, but we are historically a very speech protecting regime. And, you know, if you look at the history of the um, First Amendment in the, especially, you know, it doesn't really come to be constitutionally litigatable until the 20th century. Um, many of the groups who were uh, uh, restricted in their speech, who brought the key cases were, you know, uh, labor unions, communists, anarchists, many Jews, right? Uh, 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 civil rights protesters. I mean, the, the, the imagined free speaker today is quite different from the imagined free speaker in whose name the free speech uh, 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 doctrine was created. And, you know, one of the things when, when we were watching what was happening on August 11th, which was the night when the 400 or several hundred men with torches were walking through the university grounds, you know, even as a dean at the University Law School, I thought, how are they doing this? How, how are they allowed to walk on our grounds? And, uh, and people kept saying, I, I can't believe the university let them do this. Well, we did not, as a university, have regulations in place um, that would regulate what are called time, place, and manner regulations to, uh, to, to, to ensure that speakers who come do so within a, an appropriate time, place, and manner. And we, we didn't have that. And we, as a university, were quite open. The city had initially denied a permit to them to use the park in, in downtown. Um, and that had been overturned. Uh, the, 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 uh, a judge had said, you can't do that. That's a violation of their speech. Well, you had to apply for a permit to be in a public park but you did not have to apply for a permit to be at the university. We'd had lots of free speakers. We thought of ourselves as an open campus. This was simply not conceivable, what happened. And so one of the charges of my group that I was leading at the university was to create a time, place, and manner um, uh, uh, regulation, a neutral regulation. And as we did that and we talked to all different constituencies around the university, the thing I kept saying was like, you have to imagine that this regulation regulates the speakers you like and it regulates the speakers you don't like. And you only get one regulation and it has to be neutral and it has to regulate both. And I think there are hard and tricky questions that come up in this litigation and elsewhere about where the speech conduct distinction lies and about when it becomes a crime and, and action. Um, and here there was a conspiracy per, part of it. So when they were conspiring to do violence and, and violate people's civil rights. Um, but I, I think that distinction is, is a really important one. So Robbie, how, how, did, how did the issue come up in the case? And how did we deal, with, how did you deal with the issue? Yeah, so they used it a bunch of different ways in the case. They, they filed at the beginning of the case all kinds of motions to try to dismiss the claims on First Amendment grounds, and they lost those pretty soundly, every single one of them. Um, and then during trial, it came up a, a couple different ways. First of all, which was actually most shocking to me, <laughs> they spent a lot of time at trial actually trying to justify their beliefs. To this day, I'm not sure why they did that, um, and that's why we heard a whole bunch about Mein Kampf, because they literally told the jury, like, why they, you know, one guy said, oh, I really like Mein Kampf for the social and economic policies in it. <laughs> and, and my colleague said, you mean you don't like the Jew killing stuff? Um, and uh, there was just, an, and they talked about ethnostates and how Israel was an ethnostate, and so the United States should become a white ethnostate. And there was really lots of, crazy stuff. Um, I, I think they did it in part because they honestly believe it and in part because it was a soapbox for them, right? They were able to use the trial itself um, as a way to promote their views and kind of publicize their beliefs because it was obviously being covered. Um, another way they used it was uh, this argument, and Risa just referred to it, that because they got a permit on Saturday, therefore they kind of had this again, another kind of cockamamie theory, that that meant that everything they did on Saturday was okay. And 
it's true, they had a permit to have a rally <laughs> in the park, in what was called Lee Park in downtown Charlotte, then called Lee Park in downtown Charlottesville. They, the permit didn't say anything about committing violence. It didn't say anything about driving your car into protesters. It didn't say anything about most of what occurred that day, but they somehow thought in their heads that that permit, and there was all this discussion at trial about what the permit said and what exits to the park were okay and what entrances to the park were not. It was really a lot of detailed stuff that I think the jury paid no attention to. Uh, but that was another way they used it. Um, but in the end, and this is our co-counsel Karen Dunn's favorite um, point, and she's 100% right about it. In the end, the jury was convinced that it wasn't just about their beliefs. I, I think the jury would have not found for our plaintiffs if, it, if they thought it had just been about their beliefs. They thought it was about a, a conspiracy to commit violence. And probably the most obvious way, is, as Karen Dunn says, is that on their posters to the world, on their posters that they promoted on public social media channels rather than private uh, social media channels where you had to be admitted in to, be, to use them, they called it Unite the Right. But amongst themselves, on Discord and on various other ways they spoke, they called it the Battle of Charlottesville. And that distinction pretty much symbolized exactly was the core of what the case was about. And thank God the jury con was convinced that it was actually the Battle of Charlottesville. Um, they actually had this rally permit for speeches on Saturday. There were no speeches because of the violence that they provoked. <laughs> Uh, the, the state troopers declared uh, unlawful assembly, dispersed the crowd. There were no speeches. Um, at the end, all of these organizations went on the internet proclaiming the day is a great day for white America, whatever, and uh, I remember cross-examining one of these guys and, and saying, you said this was the, uh, the greatest day in your group, yes, but there were no speeches, right? Right, so no one got to say what they wanted to say, right? But it was, you know, we applauded the warriors. They were congratulating their warriors. So the, they wanted it to seem like a free speech rally, but it's why the former president's comments are just so dead wrong. Um, there weren't good people on both sides. The, the, the white supremacists came for one reason and one reason only, which was to provoke violence with the community that it knew would be there, uh, just uh, demonstrating against them. I should add that the, in addition to Professor Lipset, we had one other expert on these issues at trial. It's a, a guy by the name of Pete Simi who's a professor in California, but the, the most amazing thing about Professor Simi is that in the late 90s and early 2000s, he actually himself, he's a white guy, and he embedded with these groups, um, including some of the groups in our case, in California, in Utah, and various places in the United States. And he, when I say embedded, I mean he slept on their couches, he went to their parties, I mean, he really lived with these people. It's what sociologists do, I guess, and if you're studying these groups, that's what you do. As a result, he knows more about these groups and these guys than they know about themselves. So I put him on for direct, and that wasn't very hard. He just kind of lectured about uh, these various issues in the case um, that were relevant to, to his scholarship. But on cross-examination, he just devastated them because <laughs> they would try to cross-examine him about you know, their belief systems or how violence is somehow not part of it. And he knew so much more than they did about their own belief systems and their own conduct and their own history that I think the part, in some ways the most dramatic part of the case was actually their failed cross-examination of Professor Simi. I mean, it was just amazing. You know, they, they tried to cross-examine Professor Lipstadt. Yeah. Tell them what, yeah, they how tried. did that go? That was, they, we they, were so worried the night before. Um, they, were, they were petrified of cross-examining yeah. her. So most of them didn't even try. This guy, Chris Cantwell, because he just couldn't help himself, tried, and he, his last thing was, what's your favorite Holocaust joke? That was literally a question he asked. And she said, as you can imagine, I don't think the topic of genocide in which millions of Jewish people were killed is a funny topic for a joke. Um, 
But afterwards, this is funny, about a day afterwards, I, you know, I was kind of obsessive, as you can imagine, during trial, and it all of a sudden occurred to me, and I immediately called uh, Professor Lipset and I said, I got it, I got it, I got it. And she said, what? And I said, you proved their theory, their replacement theory. And she said, what do you mean? I said, because they think that you are one of these crafty, clever, brilliant Jews, and for that reason, they were too afraid to cross-examine you. <laughs> and she said, you know, you're right. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. It was, it was quite a moment when Cantwell just realized he had gotten punched in the face. He was going nowhere, and he sat down. It's one of it the only, only times, sat down. It's the only time in the trial that that guy just sat down. Uh, so um, just one last provocative question, uh, Risa. What's the, in an, in an open carry state, which the state of Virginia is. Um, what does the presence of, of guns um, do with the, the uh, permissive attitude, if you will, towards uh, hate speech? So, um, you know, now, I know you've written about this. I, I have, because I've and read I know it. You read it. Uh, <laughs> I reread it because I knew you were going to ask. Uh, I hadn't read it in a while, but um, there's a great volume about Charlottesville uh, that was put out by the University of Virginia Press uh, about a year or so afterward with a number of faculty and others in it. And so I wrote about um, this, among other things. So, you know, the First Amendment doctrine is about 100 years old, mature, mature First Amendment doctrine. And, you know, there are a lot of open questions, but there's some clear things like we were talking about and like the right to peaceful speech in public, you know, subject to time, place, and manner regulations. Um, Second Amendment doctrine is very new, brand new. Um, so the Second Amendment uh, is the, the one that uh, has been found by the Supreme Court in 2008 and beyond to be a right to bear arms, including in self-defense. Um, and, uh, and so 2008, that's, you know, baby, a baby in, in constitutional doctrine. Um, and the case in 2008 and then a follow-up case a few years later, um, those cases were about the right to have uh, handguns in the home. Uh, and there's a case at the court now um, that is about a New York uh, law that um, uh, prohibits people from uh, uh, having a license to have a gun uh, in public. And um, in the oral argument of that case, there was a, actually a fair bit of discussion in November about, um, you know, sensitive areas, bringing guns into sensitive areas, into Yankee Stadium, into crowded places. So, you know, it, the, if you've seen the footage from Charlottesville, I mean, there were weapons everywhere. And it was a little bit hard to tell you know, who was the government and who was not. And in fact, in a, a case that was brought before um, Robbie's, uh, there was a, a, a case filed that was um, filed under Virginia statute and constitution that said that militias need to be under the authority of the civil government and that these were essentially militias that were not under the civil authority of the government. Um, which led to actually some some uh, consent decrees that that prohibited them from coming back in similar circumstances. But they were armed; uh, it was visible. They were they were uh, uh, threatening with these arms. Um, and I think there are real questions that have not been answered yet that the court will answer a little bit of in this case that's that's there now. You know about the circumstances under which governments can prohibit you from bringing arms not only to a protest, but to, you know, a, a baseball game or something else. And those are open questions, and I think um, really important ones, and ones that will be informed by what happened in Charlottesville and the violence that, um, that ensued, despite the, the pretensions of being a peaceful free speech demonstration. Um, and then there's, so one piece of it is what can be prohibited on the base of the Second Amendment, um, uh, in the light of the Second Amendment. And the second is, you know, I think it's possible that they would argue that 
their bearing of arms was part of their expression under the First Amendment. Um, and, you know, you could say it's like having a peace sign if you're an anti-war protester. And the question is, is it really, <laughs> right? Is, is carrying weapons in that context really like a peace sign? Is it really just expression or does it shade over into real threats and intimidation and, um, and likelihood of imminent violence when, uh, when it's coupled in this way? And, um, you know, I think that's, a, that's an important question as well. Yeah, um, we were conscious because it's an open carry state, really not to use the weapons as part of our argument of the intentional violence, because while it means something to New Yorkers, it doesn't really mean the same uh, to people in Virginia. But I think we're- It so means the same to, to some people in Virginia. <laughs> it, um, we're, we're gonna go to some questions, but I have one last question, which every time I've spoken publicly about the case, it's asked of me, so I wanna first ask it of you, Robbie. Um, what did it feel like to be a Jew uh, doing this case? I'm not thinking about the answer. Uh, you know, even before August 2017 when this happened, I mean, I just who I am is I feel very much a Jew. But, but I never, and I grew up, I, I, I went to religious school in Cleveland, Ohio in the 70s and 80s. And it was kind of the height of the Holocaust, the Holocaust, the Holocaust, and then some more Holocaust. And I remember as a kid lying in bed at night and this is kind of crazy, but thinking to myself, what would I have done if I'd lived in Germany? Would I have known when to leave? Would I have been able to get my family out? Would I have had the guts to fight back? Like the, literally as a young girl, I would like, you know, when you're trying to go to bed at night, this is the kind of crazy stuff I would think about. But I never thought that I would face anything even close. And I'm not suggesting we're facing anything close, we're not. Um, but the idea that we were in this courtroom facing people who, if they had their way, they would reinstitute, they would oven the Jews, that's what they want, uh, was very, very kind of hung like a cloud in the courtroom, I think I would say every, uh, all the time. And I put on, uh, I started wearing a Jewish shirt, I've worn it off and on, but when I have to be a little political, when Donald Trump was elected president, I put on this Jewish star and I have not taken it off since. Um, but just before I left for Charlottesville, I, um, I had a massage or something, I took it off and I forgot it. I forgot to bring it down. And I was panicked about it because I was like, oh my God, I'm a little crazy. I don't have my Jewish star, I need a Jewish star. And I called up a friend of, of Risa and Dahlia's and I said, do you mind if I borrow your Jewish star? Um, so, Every single day in that courtroom, they obviously knew my name is Kaplan, my poor son's name is Kaplan Levine. They knew I was, I was Jewish, uh, but it really meant something, I think, to both you and me that we were in there as Jews every day fighting against these men and groups who really, really, truly despise us. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, I remember um, high holiday services before we went down for trial. I remember uh, the Hineni prayer, um, and I really spent a lot of Yom Kippur day thinking you're going to where you're supposed to be. This is what you're supposed to be doing now. Uh, it felt really good. As angry as they got, <laughs> the better I felt. I know we were there together. It was, just, it was the same. Yeah. Uh, we... We started the Friday night uh, after jury selection with Shabbat dinner <laughs> at Reese's, Robbie and me. So uh, it, was, uh, it was a wonderful experience um, actually being Jewish uh, and doing this case and being part of the community uh, and being part of, I think, what is probably gonna be part of history. Um, okay. Okay. Rabbi Andelman, do you have questions? We do have questions. Um, and I just want to say it's, it's, uh, it's, it's so eye-opening and, and chilling and moving to hear, no matter how many articles we've all read about this, it's totally different to hear the three of you speak about this. So thank you. Um, a few people have asked why 
Charlottesville. Um, if I remember correctly, there was kind of the presenting trigger of the Confederate monument, but, um, but it's not exactly a Jewish Mecca, however lovely the shul is. Um, so why do you, why do you think the, it, it was concentrated there? There, there are other Confederate monuments, other, other places it could have been. Uh, so these groups like to target um, small communities that they think are heavily liberal or dominated by liberal people. And obviously, at least within the state of Virginia, Charlottesville is kind of an example of that kind of community. Before Charlottesville, before the Battle of Charlottesville, there was what they called the Battle of Berkeley, uh, where one of these prominent guys is, is seen really decking a woman protester, and he became a huge hero after he did that. So... I think they definitely saw a link between uh, Berkeley and Charlottesville, both university towns too. And then on top of that, two of the lead defendants and really the leaders of, of the whole conspiracy were Richard Spencer, who's a UVA grad, um, and Jason Kessler, who continued to live locally, a local resident, also a UVA grad. Um, and they were, I think they're definitely both obsessed with kind of coming back to UVA, that's what Friday night was about, and dominating the campus in a way they felt they hadn't been able to do before, if, if that makes any sense. Did, how did Charlottesville, how did the town feel ab about all of this, at the lead up to the United States? I mean, I, I, I think what Robbie said, I think they were accurate in their assessment, and I think it, it's part of it, their mode, you can correct me if I'm wrong, right, of, presenting themselves as the free speakers and then the victims of uh, uh, violence on the other side, the victim, right, that's how you get to good people on both sides, right, that, that they, were, they were presenting themselves as the poor, hapless victims of other people, Antifa and others, who were the real violent ones uh, violating their free speech rights. And um, when I think, you know, the case has really shown, their, their goal was violence from the beginning, but, but they were choosing locations where they felt assured that they would be met by protesters. Um, I think our protesters were pretty peaceful, but uh, that didn't matter. But I, but I think that that was what they, they were anticipating yeah. and counting on in order to provoke the circumstances in which they would then see themselves as justified as engaging in violence. Yeah. Absolutely right. So there's a real strategy there. <laughs> Um, Can I add one last thing? I think I think the on the kind of domination of of UVA. You know, I, I mentioned before this was a real look in the mirror for UVA. But UVA had been, you know, wrestling with its past and and its past of, of slavery and white supremacy for some time. And I think they also wanted UVA to be a different kind of place than it was, you know, on its way to becoming. And uh, and I think that was part of the point too. Yeah, and I don't know if people know. They basically kept the Friday night rally secret. They, at some point late, they disclosed it, but even then they lied. They lied, they right? lied to the police. They said it was going to be to the UVA police in like this one place, but instead they marched really all through campus. Like th there was definitely- And they said a different time. Right. I mean, they, they purposefully made it impossible for them to be exactly policed. Exactly right. And they really, the way they traversed the, the university grounds, they, they clearly were making a statement with that. No question. Mm. Um, you, so you already spoke in some detail about the First Amendment. There was, there's more concern about the First Amendment, if we can go back to it. Um, so I'll just read you a couple of questions. So this is along the lines of what you, what you raised, Alan. Um, hate, hate crimes are a result of hate speech. Hate speech begets hate crimes. So um, the question is, you know, how, really, how can we justify... Um, justify hate speech um, under the Constitution, and more specifically, how do we prevent hate crimes if what leads to them is protected? And uh, the, the next question about the First Amendment is, do you think it's outdated? <laughs> do we, um, it, the person wrote, it seems that, sorry, it seems no longer true that truth will defeat lies. Do we need something more like, you know, how Germany has dealt with, with hate speech, Nazi speech? That's all yours. Uh, that's, that's, that's for you, this is for you, Risa. <laughs> 
I mean, you know, I, uh, I think the relationship between speech and violence is not linear, right? And so, sure, you can say hate speech leads to hate crimes, but you can also say suppressing of speech can lead to crimes, right? And uh, so I, I don't think it necessarily uh, is a is a one-to-one -one correlation in a, in a very clear way. You know, I think um, at the moment when, uh, when this was happening, I was frustrated because I felt like the, um, the white supremacists were sometimes more successfully than I thought they should be uh, gaining the mantle of the free speaker. And so the protests against them were, um, were, were, were finding it hard to gain a footing, right? And, and, and to, to successfully protest against them in, in ways that were, uh, 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 you know, not then violating the free speech, not then actually, you know, violating the free speech of the, of the white supremacists. And I, I just remember thinking, you know, how, to, how do you, you know, this isn't always where we've been, right? And as I was saying before, historically, the free speakers have been very different groups of people. Um, and, and I think we've seen since then free speakers being very different groups of people. Um, and and I, I do think, like, we get one First Amendment. And... Uh, and I and I and I think that's really important. And we're seeing again. I mean, you know, I'm in Virginia now, and we now have laws that restrict the teaching of inherently divisive concepts uh, in our in our K-12 schools. And you know, what is an inherently divisive concept, and who gets to decide what that is? And uh, and that seems really problematic to me. Um, and and I I think you know when you're talking. So I'll say one other thing. When you're talking about um, you know, the First Amendment. The First Amendment prohibits government from suppressing people's speech. And I think that when people are talking about free speech today and talking about the First Amendment today, they have a sense that anyone who tells me not to talk or anyone who characterizes my speech in a way that I don't like is somehow violating your free speech. They're not. That's not what the First Amendment protects against, right? And I, and I think um, if, if you say something and someone says you're a racist, that person hasn't violated your free speech. In fact, they're engaging in counter speech to your speech, right? And, and I think the call on free speech it has become a kind of talisman that um, that has become un counterproductive. But that's quite different from what it is the First Amendment really does, which is protect against the government choosing which speakers can speak and which speakers can't speak. And, and that, I think, is really important. An, an, another piece of this, I think, is leadership at the government level. Um, Look, it's, it's no secret, because we read what these people said among themselves on the Discord channel, that the former president's uh, administration was like a green light, where earlier administrations, Republican or Democrat, were really a red light on this kind of conduct. We're discouraging this kind of conduct. So there are people that have had these anti-Semitic views that were underground for so many years, but they openly said to one another on the internet channel that Trump was like green lighting this kind of conduct and that they felt more comfortable about it. So sometimes it's not so much what the government can't do, but what the government should be doing to, to raise the level of, of, uh, of discourse, to in, encourage tolerance. Uh, so it's, um, it's a complicated issue. I, I'm, I'm also for the First <laughs> Amendment. Uh, I'm not ready to give it up. But, um, but what happened on those streets what, what, in the name of right, the First that's Amendment that's, is like... We agree on that. Red, we Ridiculous. Can I add one other thing, which is to the to the question about you know is it outdated? I think that there are a lot of young people who think that it is, and you know I think um, I'm frequently I'm a scholar of the 1960s among other things, and 
the, you know, I am reminded of that era in the generational conflict that we see over, you know, what speech should people be engaging in, over what should be protected, over what legal doctrine should look like. And I think, um, you know, st students, my students, college students today do have a different sensibility. And, you know, in the kind of relationship between, you know, speech and harm, they see a different relationship. And uh, and I think they're going to find ways to try to bring cases that will reshape that relationship. And it could happen. I'm not sure that it will, but and I'm not advocating for it. But but that's you know, legal change does happen. Doctrines do change, and I think there's quite a lot of energy um, among the generation of folks who are, you know, in college today to say, you know, exactly the kinds of things that the questioner was, was asking. And, and, and I, don't, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's all contingent and it can be contested and it's contestable and people are contesting it. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's worth having conversations about kind of the relationship between liberty and equality or the relationship between speech and harm, like the ones that you're asking. I think those are really important conversations. Let's see if we can squeeze in one more. Um, so notwithstanding what you were just saying about kind of um, the evolution of thinking on the, the space between speech and harm, as you put it, there's a question about um, extra legal strategies and, and consequences for, um, for perpetrators of this kind of activity, such as you know, your images on social media and you end up losing your job. Um, so do you think that do you think that those extra legal consequences maybe, um, do they fill the space between, um, you know, that gap between what's protected and um, what the dangers can be? So I have thoughts about that, but Robbie, do you want to talk first? So it actually came up quite a bit in this case. In, in the early part of the case during discovery, there was one of the co-conspirators, um, their hashtag, I can't remember which social media medium it was, but their hashtag was Kristallnacht, I think, or something like that. I um, mean, they had said some really horrible things in the planning sessions for Unite the Right. Um, and we fought to get the messages of this hashtag Kristallnacht, and we didn't expose them, but the person, as I understand it, was exposed. They had a tech job in California, and they lost their job. Um, and the defendants in, in our case were crazed about this, because they think we had something to do with this person losing their job, which we really did not. Um, you know, I mean, legally speaking, most companies have a right to terminate you. I mean, there are actually a couple places in Seattle you have a, you can't be discriminated on in political speech, but the, the rest of the country, you can lose your job if you say or do things like that that your employer finds abhorrent. Um, I don't think that makes up the difference. Um, I think what makes up the difference here is, is, as the FBI acknowledged, they were kind of asleep at the switch. Um, the, the kind of rise of domestic extremism and terrorism in the country was happening, and they were just not focusing on it. And they know how to infiltrate groups like this. They know how to kind of go after their conspiracies, and they just weren't doing it. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not necessarily against employers or others having that right, but I, I don't think it will make up the difference. So I, I'm just going to say, I, I do think that um, the Me Too movement and, uh, and some of what has come to be called cancel culture is a reflection of um, a disappointment with legal remedies, right? And the, the sense that the law hasn't been doing its job and therefore people are turning to, you know, are, are either, you know, taking actions themselves to shame, right? I would have said years ago, right, we are not a shaming culture, <laughs> we're a guilt culture. Um, and I think that has really changed in, in the last decade or so. And, um, and I think it's a reflection of people's dissatisfaction with legal remedies and their failure to really respond to some of the problems. That's, that's neither an endorsement nor a, a, a defense of it, but, or, a, or a criticism of it. But I, I do think, and it, I thought it was really striking in the aftermath of the spring 2020 and summer 2020 um, protests uh, after George Floyd and, and other police violence that so much of the energy, and this is you know me, the legal historian thinking here, 
so much of the energy of the movement at that time and continuing today is directed to institutions and individuals and organizations and companies. It's not directed to the law to mandate these things. And I think that's partly that there is, people have platforms that they didn't used to have because of social media and they're using those platforms. And it's partly, I think, a, a lack of, of faith in the law, right? So as a legal historian, I think, how are we gonna look back on this moment and what role does civil rights laws play and what role, and you know, I think the case that you brought really shows the continued relevance of civil rights laws, but I, I think they're under pressure and, uh, and the, the norm-based responses are becoming far more important for that reason. And, and it took us four years to get to trial and tens of millions of dollars of legal fee time. Not um, to mention security and, and all the other costs. Yeah, and um, and you know, judgments that if we get affirmed, we're going to have to go collect. Um, it's obvious why people could be frustrated with the legal system. It's also why it's so important to have brought the case. Um, so uh, we're past our yeah, time. So, um, so I want to thank you. Of course, this discussion was so um, so nuanced and substantive, and it was really perfect for JTS. You know where we're kind of dealing with um, how law and reality meet and, and how law can be deployed creatively to um, you know, bring about the values that we care about. So um, it was just the right discussion to have right here on this stage. We're so grateful to you, uh, to the three of you, not only for your time tonight, but you know, for your wisdom and leadership out there in the world. So thank you so much. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us in person and online. And I can't resist. Rabbi, you mentioned uh, Dahlia Lithwick and Rabbi Jan Urbach. One week from tonight, oh, yeah. they will both be right here um, for a discussion also with Rabbi Gordon Tucker on, um, on civil discourse and the role of journalists and clergy. Um, and it should be wonderful. So I hope you join us then. Um, and, and for all of our other upcoming programs here at JTS, whether in person or online. Thank you again so much to the three of you and everyone have a good night. Thank you.